Chair Ellis, and I work with an organization called Myler Disability. I am a partner with the, that organization, and I'm also our operations officer. Um, Myler Disability is an organization that is nationwide, and we represent individuals before the Social Security Administration uh, in disability actions, for uh, Medicare actions, to get reimbursements uh, for hospitals, for medical expenses that they've incurred in an effort to get insurance is through Medicaid or Medicare. And we have one central office that's in Utah, and then we have regional offices all over the country. And so we're nationwide, we handle claims in all 50 states, and have kind of a unique model in that. Uh, our attorneys all work out of their houses, and their staffs are all managed centrally. So all of the mail comes into one location, uh, the, the staffs of the various attorneys are all um, and central in one location. And so the attorneys can all work off of our CRM and they can all interface with that directly. In terms of the amount of mail we get, we process really high volumes of mail. We get about 10,000 pieces of mail a day that we have to process. And as I indicated earlier, we work in all 50 states and the program itself is administered through the states. And so that would mean that one document would look different depending on the state that it came from, though it would be the same document. And so it gave us a great deal of variety to our documents because the same document could conceivably have 50 different variations. So our workflow is determined by document type. So as a certain type of document comes in, whether that would be a document that's a denial or whether that's a retaining packet where we've signed up a particular client for our services, uh, how they classify that document would determine where it goes, which staff is going to be working on the case, and then what they should be doing on the case uh, based on the type of document that they received. And so we had 500 or so variations on the docs, and subtle differences could you know, make a, a big difference in terms of what would happen in the workflow. And so getting the documents classified appropriately was uh, very important for us. We, at the time, would train a few classifiers, so we would have people that we would train on these uh, multitude of documents, and it would take literally months to train somebody in all the different variations of the documents. And if they got that wrong, of course, it created a little difficulty for us. And then we would also have the concern and worry that this person might go somewhere, you know, maybe they move out of state or uh, they find a different job. And so if we did lose somebody that was trained in uh, the reading of the documents and the classifying of the documents, well, that was kind of a big hit for the business. So about 200,000 documents processed a month, uh, 500 different types of documents, uh, created the, the problems I indicated with the training. Uh, just some examples by way of complexity issues. Uh, certain documents uh, would be the same, but vary based on where it was signed, for example. And so we had a representation document that might be signed with the primary representative's name. Uh, that would be one variation of the document, an unsigned document. We might have a document that was signed by a secondary re representative. We might sign a, doc a document that was signed by a client. Uh, or the document might be signed by the client but possibly in the wrong spot. Or we'd have a document that's signed by the client but it wasn't dated, or it was dated in the wrong spot. And so for each of these different document types, we would have a different upload option that would create a different workflow based on the document. And so, again, just adding the complexity was that the same document could have all different types of variations. Now it was the same thing with our fee agreements. And so we could have an incorrect signature, we could have uh, an unsigned document by a certain representative, uh, we could have one that was done correctly, uh, and then we would need different fee agreements at different times during the process. And so if the case became contested and we had to appeal it to a judge, well that's a different fee agreement. And if the judge then denies it, we've got to go to the next level. Again, that's another fee agreement. The document isn't basically the same, but you, know, you could have seven or eight different iterations uh, based on what we were in the process. And so these types of issues essentially added to the complexity of our difficulty. It was a long training time, as I indicated, to get them to speed on things. And then it was also a lot of difficult to work because we would have it assigned by one person blindly, and because it was so critical that we got it right, it would go out with the staffer on the case, and we would also have them classify the document blindly. And if we got a match, then we would assume that was a proper classification. If we got a mismatch, it would go to a third person uh, that would then kind of be the arbiter and, and uh, would, would determine the proper classification of the document. 
So all struggles that we are dealing with as a business, uh, we are very automated and we're entirely paperless, and so uh, we're constantly looking for solutions like uh, which Kofax uh, products would offer. Uh, we were aware of OCR and OCR uh, reading softwares, and so uh, had looked a couple of years back into trying to automate some of this, uh, because obviously with the volumes of mail that we have, it's very cumbersome. Uh, so I contacted a group that did uh, OCR, they came in, they looked at all of our documents, and essentially told us that our problem was too complex. Uh, that we had too many different document types with the 50 iterations of each of them coming from different states. Uh, that it just wasn't anything that they thought that they could do. And so we looked at everything and, and uh, uh, that, that was kind of the verdict that we just couldn't be helped. Uh, so I was disappointed by that, uh, but we moved on and continued doing what we were doing for a couple of years uh, until uh, I was put in touch with, with Michael, who uh, came in contact with me through a mutual acquaintance and uh, he told us, told me about what he does and, and said he thought maybe he could help with uh, some of the issues that we had in processing our documents. And I told him that I'd already gone down that road and, and I, I know that he's eager and excited thinking that maybe we're a good client, uh, but that in the final analysis he would determine himself that our documents were too complex to be done. And so he said, well, give me a shot. So we met up and spent some time together and I, I gave him a bunch of sample documents and you know, it was nice. I mean, I said, how would you read these? And he said, well, you know, how do you know what a document is? And I said, well, I would look here and look here. And he said, well, that's what we do. The software do the same thing. And so, you know, explaining that it's more than just a template approach, but it's actually reading content. Uh, so, you know, I think the solution, what was crucial to us was really partnering with the right people. But I was personally skeptical that we would be successful uh, just because of how uh, extensive our documents were and how many variations that we had. So we had meetings with Michael and, and uh, discussed this. He came back with a working prototype uh, that we could run our document samples through and it looked as though on the, pre the preliminary pass that it was successful. And then he brought his team in and we got to work on the project. Well, it turned out the project was in fact more complex than than we had originally contemplated. And his group, working with our group, uh, really through the collaboration, uh, was successful in coming up with uh, a lot of unique solutions. Design. So kind of this agile and collaborative approach that they brought to our business uh, to come in and, and work one-on-one -on -one with our staffers, explain and, and uh, get things as correctly as possible. So slow going at the outset, but with time and work and collaboration from both sides, uh, we started seeing really successful outcomes. So some of the things that were tricky when we tried to put this in place were that our group used different terms uh, than, than the people at Kofax were using. Uh, things like manual processing, batch classes, extraction, online learning, validation operations. Those were all terms that we used internally that our Kofax team used as well. And those words meant different things to them than they meant to us. And so we were sometimes having confusion in that regard, uh, just knowing what we meant by certain terms. I think another lesson we learned was that we had a tendency at the outset to focus on the documents that were the most easily readable by Kofax. And so if Kofax, they thought could read it easily, well then that was where we were gonna start. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily consistent with the documents that we had in the highest volumes. And so doing it over again, we would probably focus on high volume first and take the hit on getting the software to be able to read those. Uh, another thing that was helpful for us was uh, the visualizations, uh, to be able to see the big picture, so the utilization of the flowcharts uh, for our staff so that they can understand the process fully uh, and be able to see the process kind of from start to finish. And so those were some of the things that, that they brought to the table, uh, lessons learned. Uh, the business case for it, if you guys can read the slide, so, so far it's working out really well for us. Our goal was to try and save six to eight employees in our front office. Within the first two months, we had saved five full-time employees, and the production is still ramping up. Uh, we have a lot of documents, but we're currently processing 35 to 40% of the documents uh, using COFAX. In fact, last month we checked, and it was at 43%. And so, so far we are, we're happy with that. Another, another positive result uh, is that 
we would do the double blind classification. So we'd have somebody classifying the document initially, this was all done by people looking at it, and they would classify, and then we'd go to the second employee that would also classify. But one thing we found with COFAX was that COFAX was so effective at classifying that on the second round of classification, if there ever was a disagreement, it was, in every instance, the human that was classifying it wrong. And so it's been nice for us because we've been able to get rid of, on a lot of the documents, that second level of classification. So in terms of the business case, uh, so far it is looking very good for us. Uh, we are reaching our goals in terms of the amount of personnel that we have working doing document classification. And our goal is to get to 70% of the docs. And so we're continuing to refining and trying to get more and more of them to go through the COPAC software. In terms of future projects, now that we've seen what it can do, uh, we've been thinking of other ways that we can utilize the software in our business. We compile medical records files for administrative law judges that adjudicate these cases. And one of our biggest difficulties is getting duplicate evidence out of these files. And so they're compiling these files as time goes on, and we've got to collect the medical records on any, any individual that has a claim. And so when we collect medical records, we'll ask for medical records within certain data ranges. The medical records will come in, we'll add them to a judge's file, and then nine months may pass, and we might need to get updated medical records. Well, when we send in the medical records request, we will put a certain date range on the request and say, we just need the, the medical records as the next date. But when the facility gets the request, they never look at the date, and they just drop everything in the mail that, that they have, and we get a giant pile of medical records. And if we submit the big pile onto the judge, the judge is going to be angry with us saying, why are you sending me all these records that I already have? I've already seen these. I, I, I don't want to waste my time reviewing records that I've seen before. And so one of the things we have to do whenever we get medical records is we have to go back to the physical file and we have to look and see if we already have these date ranges in the file. And it's, in, in terms of paper and processing difficulty, it creates real trouble for us because many of the medical records come in electronically. Well, we don't have the ability to side by side look at an electronic file and look at the medical records on one screen, look at the file on the other screen. And so what they've done is gotten the medical records electronically, printed them on a printer, looked at, the, looked at the paper documents and compared them with an electronic file. If they see duplicates, and these will be four or 500 page uh, sets of documents sometimes, but if they identify duplicates, then they will pull those out. And then once they've pulled out everything they think is duplicate, then they've got to order the evidence all by date. Uh, very time consuming for people. Uh, once they have organized it by date and they have all the duplicates removed, we would then shred those documents after we've uploaded them as kind of a clean file, and then those will be submitted. So what the COFAX is enabling us to do is for us to run the documents through COFAX and run the judge's file through COFAX, and then it will create a match. If there are matches, it will identify them. And so you might have up to 400 pages, it can say, well, these 60 or these 70 are are identical to other documents in the file, and then you can open it up and look side by side, and you know, when, if they're duplicates, you can, of course, have them removed. And then once we're done with that, we can go in and insert the dates on the various visits, and then export them to a file with no duplicates and out by date. And so, uh, in the process of making this one work right now, but really very excited about it. And so we think that will have a good return on our investment, and also, uh, reduce the number of employees that are working on these cases. So other things that we're looking at are uh, reading the medical records that we have to identify the types of cases. Are there other claims that we could be making on these cases based on certain keywords uh, that we can identify in the medical records? Uh, so it's been great, frankly, working with good partners in this, and I think our experience so far has been tremendous. Uh, it's a great product, and uh, we feel as though you know, within a certain amount of time, a very short period of time, we'll have received a good return on the investment, and then as we move forward in the future, uh, then, you know, we'll pay us those dividends year after year. And so, good experience with the software. Uh, it's great what you guys are doing uh, out there for businesses. And I guess with that, I'll turn the time over to, to Michael Lyons. CEO over at DocsTech. We're a COFAX partner. We've been working with COFAX for about 10 years uh, and are a COFAX Diamond partner. Um, have had the opportunity to work on a, a 
pretty wide variety of projects, but are excited to talk today a little bit about the project that we worked together with Jared and the Milo team on creating. So like, like Jared talked about, Milo Disability is an advocate for those patients who are filed for Social Security Disability claims. And they have a, a tremendous number of different document types because of the kind of business that they're in. And so as we talked to Jared, there were really two major projects that we identified. The first was the question about whether or not we could automate, uh, automate the document classification. So could we scan in all these documents and automatically identify what kind of document they were among the 500 or so document types that Myla had identified? And the second piece of that project then was once we scanned in these documents, for any of them that were part of the medical record or would be added to the medical exhibit, could we identify whether or not the documents that we had received were duplicated in the medical exhibit that the, that the company already had for this particular patient? Uh, the first phase of that project is the automated classification phase. And uh, like Jared mentioned, we started on that project back in July of last year and went into production in January. It was a six-month project for us. And essentially, it was about two and a half months of development and about two and a half months of uh, user acceptance testing. Jared mentioned to you that we are essentially at 43% of their documents today are being run through the COFAX model. The reason that that's where it is is because having those documents classified correctly is extremely critical to the Myler process. They've got an extensive set of workflow steps uh, in their own line of business application that these documents are routed to based on these classifications. And in the COFAX world, we sometimes would call document classifications being sort of a general type of document. And then within that classification criteria, we then would have metadata, which would determine in some instances how these documents were routed around and where they were sent for processing and approval. It, it goes back to the, the uh, lesson learned that Jared mentioned earlier, and that was, again, document types. Myler called every single one of those variations a different document type. And many of them had different writing, routing rules. So even based on the specific state form that was filled out, as you can imagine, it might need to go to a different attorney that specializes in disability claims for that particular state. So even small nuances between what we might look at and consider to be the same document type were important to the Myler business model. And so from a classification standpoint, then we were, we were put in a position where we had to, we had to be able to tell what were these and, and where do they need to go and how do they need to be routed. So what was important for us then or what was, what was key to how we were able to do this successfully? Uh, one of them certainly was integration. Uh, whenever you talk about leveraging the power of COFAX, any information that we can gain contextually uh, from a line of business, uh, knowledge about the process, helps us do a better job of using the technology to automate the process. And so in the Myler case, we integrated tightly with their existing line of business application. They had a program that they had written in-house that they use as their CRM system, as their process automation and document repository system. And so we integrated tightly with that to understand what were the document types, where was this client in the process of having their case heard and appealed and finally de uh, decisioned on, um, and where did these need to go? What information did we need to know from the document in order to properly route it based on what kind of a document it was and where the client was in the process? Um, we did do a, some initial sorting during the document prep stage. So before documents were even scanned, we did do some initial sorting. We separated out, as an example, those that were part of the medical exhibit file. They were scanned into separate batch classes so that we could actually apply a separate set of KTM project rules to those medical records as opposed to the other claims documents that they were receiving that went through a separate set of uh, KTM processes. And we also worked to be able to collect and capture all of, all of the different document types that Myler was receiving. Some of their documents came in via fax, some of them came in from an email, some of them were downloaded from a portal, some of them came in through a traditional scanner. It was important for us as we implemented the COFAX solution that it was truly a multi-capture multi solution for them. So uh, how did we do it then? Well, classification was key, and we did it essentially by leveraging, and I say we, just to be clear, by the way, it was my team. So I had, like Jared mentioned, I'm kind of on the sales side, so we joke about this a little bit with that within DocsTech, but our team sort of promises things, and our implementation team has to do it. So I don't want to take any credit, because I did not do this. And uh, feel free to ask any questions you want. I'll try to accurately communicate what our team built. But they did a great job 
in understanding how COFAX could be used, the power of the tool, and then leveraging that to provide the business value that we on the sales side had promised to the customer. We started with what we call uh, layout-based classification. And I recognize that we have members of the audience that probably are very familiar with COFAX and then some of you that may be relatively new. So I'm going to just briefly describe what each of the different classification methods are and how we use them in the case of Myler. So layout-based classification is essentially what you think about in what does a document look like. You look at a document and based on how it's laid out or what it looks at looks like, you can tell from a high level, is this an invoice, is this a contract, is this an application, is this a, a, a form. Uh, it, it's, it's the easiest way to do classification, it's the quickest way to do classification in the COFAX world, and it does a great job initially if you have pretty distinct differences in the way a document looks. So layout-based layout classification for the Myler project was the way we started, and it provided a great framework for us, but it didn't provide enough um, detailed differentiation between the, the various document types that we had. So we went on to content-based classification. Content-based classification is where you're going to OCR the entire page, and then based on the OCR content of the page, you're now going to make a distinction between what the document type is. The downside to content-based classification is that you've OCR the entire page and you're comparing the entire page to basically an entire OCR page that you have in your sample set. So it works well until you get again some of the very small nuances that we found in the Myler model. One of those examples is we have something called a 20-day notice and a 75-day notice. Well, the layout is exactly the same. It's a notice and 99% of all the words on the page are exactly the same. The only difference is it says 20 instead of 75. So in order to classify between documents that are this similar, you essentially have to go on to what we call instruction or context-based classification. And that means that you have to give extra weight to certain types of words that fall within certain context on the document. So obviously, the words that fall just before the word notice so 20-day notice, the, the, the set of words that come just before notice as an example, were more important to us than any other word on the entire page. And so by, using the, by understanding the context of this document, then we were able to accurately classify the difference between a 20-day notification and a 75-day notification. Uh, so the COFAX tools, I guess my, my kind of overarching method about classification, are extremely powerful. Uh, the more you can understand about the documents that you're working with, uh, whether that's a barcode that's on them, a form number that's on them, a separator sheet that you've used, any information that you can glean as you capture those documents can help you in building your classification model. And all of those things were really important to us as we worked with uh, Jared and his team on the Myler project. We also used the COFAX online learning extensively as we moved into the user acceptance testing. Uh, like I say, that for us was fairly long. It was two and a half months. Uh, to initially go into production, and his team is still certifying a different doc additional document types. So as we essentially continue to roll through document types, uh, the number of documents that are being classified by the system automatically, we're up to 43 today, our goal is to be at 70% automated classification within the next month or two. As the model continues to get better, and as his team continues to gain confidence that classification is being done correctly. Um, one other aspect of classification I think that would be important as you consider doing a similar project within your organization. Often in the COFAX model, um, when you use uh, classification of any type, that's a step that happens before extraction. So as you think about a typical COFAX workflow, you're going to capture the documents that you need, you're going to do all the image cleanup that you can to give you the very best images possible, and then you're going to go through and try and classify them. And based on the classification, then you're going to go through and do your OCR and do your extraction. However, in our case, because we were using that OCR content in a way that it was critical for doing the classification, we actually created a data field for each of our document types as part of the batch class that was classification. We alphabetized the classification types in that dropdown so that as the users reviewed these documents, and if there were corrections that they needed to make, the various classification types were in the drop-down, they were alphabetized, they could start to type a classification type and it would fill in the rest of that form, it would auto-fill it for them. But it also allowed for us to change the classification type as we continued through the model. 
So we would use layout-based classification initially, but then as we got into content and instruction and context-based classification, we could change the value in that drop-down in order to accurately classify the documents before we presented it to a validation operator in the instances where that needed to happen. So having the classification type as a document field for each document was, was an important decision that the design team made as part of the project. After classification, then we needed to know who these documents were for. And so we went on to what's traditionally called extraction. Uh, this would be reading um, or mining the documents for the key pieces of data that we needed to determine which Mylar client were these documents for. And we did that essentially based on the document type. Uh, as you can imagine, some document types have a social security number and some don't. In some cases we were reading social, in some cases we were reading the name. Uh, we were able to use the COFAX match and merge server so that it was a fuzzy match that we were doing. We didn't have to have an exact name. We had done a lookup through our integration with their in-house line of business application so we knew which clients they had. We knew what social security numbers, for example, were valid social security numbers within our model and which customer names were valid names. And so we were able to compare the results that we were reading off of the document with this dictionary that we were creating based on the lookup that we did with their in-house line of business application. And that allowed for us to accurately then identify who the client was that these documents were for as we received them. So what did we learn from the project? Um, the, the collaboration was key. I think we often go into a project like this and recognize that Many of, many of us as solution providers have worked with COFAX for many years. And so sometimes there's a temptation to say, you know, we know COFAX and we, we, we understand what, how to build this product for you, so tell us what you want and we'll build it. For us, when we work with clients like Myler, and especially as we look at more and more complex projects, it's very important that that um, interaction be collaborative and that it not only be collaborative, but, the, but that it be iterative. So it was key for us that we have access to both the IT side of the Myler group as well as the business side. And we worked very closely with them. We had regular meetings. We presented on a regular basis about the progress we were making around the model. And sometimes we would take two or three steps forward and sometimes we would take two steps back in trying to get the model to accurately identify the document types that they had. I, I think, and, and, and not to um, toot the horn too much, I guess, of our team, but it was very rewarding for me as we met with Jared and his staff just a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, you know, we're going to be giving this presentation. What would you like us to talk about? What kinds of things did you learn as you went through this process? And uh, they said that interaction with the Docs Tech team, that time that they spent actually work, watching us work, not just in the conference room asking questions, but sitting down and watching us do our job was extremely important. They said, in fact, we actually offered one of your guys a job. We want to know if he'll come work for us because we're pretty sure that he knows our documents better than we do. Uh, so luckily, he didn't take the job. Craig is actually here, so I can joke about it because uh, he spent a lot of time with that client. And it was, it was important that we learn their world. Uh, that we sit in their shoes, that we watch them work. Otherwise, we never would have been able to, to build this model in a way that it would work for them. We did know the technology, and that was important, but they knew their business and they knew their documents. And so, really having the um, humility, maybe, uh, having the willingness to listen and work together was critical for us to achieve the success that we did. Um, other lessons learned, so discovery is, all, is always something for us that's important. We always talk about it from a project manager standpoint, and yet this was another example as we looked back on the project where we could have done even more. Oftentimes, an engineering team is anxious to jump in and start building the solution. They want to demonstrate the value of the product. Uh, you know, they, they've got enough of an understanding that they think they can jump in and start building the model. We could have done a better job in this case in spending some more time documenting the process, doing the detailed discovery, and I believe we would have even shortened the implementation time frame for this particular customer if we had done a little bit better job of that. Now, we still met the time frame that we set. We still were able to implement within the six months that we had told them as an estimated project time frame. Uh, but for us, making that investment in discovery 
uh, was a lesson that we learned and one that we were again reminded is extremely important when you talk about designing complex solutions like this. An example of that was around the documents that we choose to fo chose to focus on. And Jared mentioned this before, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but we had chose to focus on those that we felt like would be the easiest to, to uh, automatically classify. We talk about this concept around quick wins, sometimes in a strategy that you take around a project. However, because ROI was so important to the customer, because they wanted to understand what the value of the solution was going to be, we would have provided more value for them quicker if we had spent the extra time and focused on the documents based on the volumes that they received. So, you know, you can look at a list of 500 documents, they know how many they receive every month. Uh, we, we finally did go to that model, um, but we could have gone there quicker and provided value to the customer a, um, a little bit more quicker, a little more quickly in the project if we had, if we had focused in that way. So, uh, I wanted just to touch on briefly the next project that Jared talked about. Uh, somebody asked me about it earlier, and uh, we want to be clear about the difference between what we've done and what's in production, and what we're working on and planning. So, just to be clear, the project that we've talked about up to this point is, is in production. Uh, Jared talked about the business value that they're receiving from it. We did identify up front as part of the sales process that there was a second phase, there was a second project, and it was this idea that we could, well, the question was, could we look at two scanned medical records and tell you whether or not they were duplicated? And so the second project that we're actually working on with them now uh, involves taking the XDOC information, if you're familiar with the COFAX model, that you receive when you run the OCR, and comparing those the XDOC data that you gather from two different COFAX documents and being able to determine what percentage likelihood there is that the two documents are duplicated. Uh, when you start to talk about medical records and medical exhibit files, this becomes fairly complicated because you may have one set of medical records that was received from the doctor. Those are the original. Those medical records then may have been faxed to a hospital. And so when we receive them at Myler, they, we, they come in as a fax copy from the hospital. They're actually the same record. They're covering the same time frame and the same set of doctor's visits. And if you present both of those to a judge, he gets pretty upset. In fact, Jared talked about cases where a judge would actually throw the case out because you had so much duplication within your file. And so we wanted to know whether or not these two were the same document. But traditional OCR and some of the standard uh, methods didn't necessarily work for us. We have been able to build a model. We're still in development of this solution for them today um, around this idea that we can accurately look at not only the XDOC data, which essentially is the sum of all OCR data that COFAX has collected, but also start to capture information about how many lines of text are on the page and how many actual physical lines are on the page and based on a collection of that data then tell you the likelihood that two medical records duplicated. And in instances where we think the likelihood is high that they're duplicated, we then present those to an operator for them to make a decision about whether or not it's actually a duplicate document. If it's duplicated, they can then, rem they can then delete the duplicate from the file and then accurately order the exhibit file before they output it and prepare it for. Uh, presentation before the judge. So that's the next exciting project we're working on and uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's always challenging for us when we come in and they tell us that it can't be done or that somebody else has met with them and told them that it was too complex. But um, that's a challenge that we enjoy taking on. We like those instances where somebody says, hey, we've tried it and couldn't do it because we've had a lot of success over the years working with COFAX and the COFAX tools. And, uh, and, and implementing projects successfully by investing in understanding the business problem and investing in knowing the COFAX tools and then trying to marry those two.